This is the Too Tall Sports Podcast. Thank you for being with me today. My interview is with Jeff Perlman. He is the New York Times bestselling author of nine sports books. And we're going to talk all about his newest one today called Three Ring Circus, the Kobe, Shaq, Phil, and the crazy years of the Lakers dynasty. I had a great time talking about the, the uh, 90s and 2000s Lakers with him. Uh, we dive into Kobe and Shaq and Phil and all the role players and, and everybody involved in those years. Jerry West and how Kobe became a Laker, how Shaq got to L.A., all the stories on that. But we also talk about some other books that Jeff has written, like Gunslinger, talking about Brett Favre's career. We talk about Walter Payton and the book called Sweetness, uh, talking about his career. And we also talk about Barry Bonds and, and Roger Clemens and Ken Griffey Jr. And uh, Jeff used to be a writer for Sports Illustrated after his days at the University of Delaware and uh, his, his time writing for uh, a food and fashion magazine in, in Nashville, Tennessee. So. We talked to Jeff Perlman, had a great time interviewing him. As always, you can follow the show at Two Tall Sports Podcast on Instagram. On Twitter, it's at Two Tall Sports. Uh, you can find me on YouTube as well, Two Tall Sports Podcast. I'm there. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, pretty much everywhere. Um, if you do get a chance to subscribe, please do so. And also uh, rate and review if you're on Apple Podcasts. Scroll all the way down to the end of the episodes page. Hit the five star. I'd really appreciate it so we can move uh, move the show along and get some, some more notoriety for it. That'd be a, a really big help. Uh, thanks for listening as always. And I'll catch you on the other side after my interview with Jeff Perlman. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Two Tall Sports Podcast. My next guest is a New York Times bestselling author. He's written nine books, including his most recent one that we're going to discuss today on the podcast. It's called uh, The Three Ring Circus, Kobe, Shaq, and Phil in the Crazy Years of the Lakers Dynasty. So we're going to talk about all the, the early 2000s, late 90s Lakers stuff. Um, and according to his website, he was a, a world-class track and cross-country star at the University of Delaware. Uh, he's a big Holland Oats fan, and he also is a he lives in Orange County, just like me. So happy to have him on the show. He's Jeff Perlman. What's up, Jeff? How are you? So my world class. <laughs> I my dream in life was to be a Division One runner. Like my one of my athletic goals was to be a Division One runner, and I was a a good local high school runner. You know, like okay. in my small county, I was one of the better runners. Right. And I reached out when I was looking at schools. I reached out to a coach at the University of Delaware, and I said, you know, what's the deal? And he said they take walk-ons and they took a walk on and I just got my ass kicked every week <laughs> as a freshman track indoor. But I, um, you had to come in top three in an indoor track meet to get a varsity letter. And I came in third in a dual meet against Lehigh. It was Delaware Lehigh. And I got my letter and there were only three of us in the race, but I still came in third. And I got the letter. <laughs> and that counts. There you go, man. Yeah, I want to ask you about where you went to school in a minute. Uh, just want to do a couple shout outs here. Uh, just shout out uh, David Ostrowski. He, he got us uh, hooked up on this. So I appreciate that. And uh, just to tell the audience, I was talking to Jeff Preshow, but um, kind of my radio idol is Jim Rome. And so we both, I, I heard him interviewed on there. And so now I was able to, to get him on. So it's pretty cool. And Jeff knows Jim too. So it's, it's all full circle here. So it's really mm -hmm. cool. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to start with, uh, I know you grew up in, in is it Mahopic? <laughs> Well, it's Mayo it? Pack, although Mayo some of the locals will argue it's Mayo Pack. So. Okay. So you grew up there, and I mean, you, you've now written two books about the Lakers. Did you grow up a Knicks fan? Like, what were you, who were your teams when you were growing up? No, I was, a, uh, I was a, a New Jersey Nets fan, diehard. I was a Mets fan. Um, I was a, my biggest love was the New York Jets, okay. by far, which sucks. So uh, <laughs> that was my... I'm not really a fan. Of, I mean, I still root for the Jets, if anything, but generally I've, I've left my cheering behind. They almost went undefeated season. They had to win a game and, and blow the draft pick. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the most Jet thing ever. And a friend of mine who's a diehard Jet fan is like, well, maybe, maybe Jacksonville loses to Chicago next week. And I'm like, have you – I mean, beat Chicago. And I'm like, have you, have you not paid attention? That's not how it ever works for the Jets. The worst thing to happen will happen. The – Trevor Lawrence will go number one to Jacksonville, and then we'll pick like a 
a wide receiver from the University of New Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, the Jets. It's got to be tough for you. At least, you know, at least you're out here now living. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. You know. It's all right. Um, I, I did want to ask you about deciding to go to University of Delaware. Just, you know, kind of where did that come from? And, you know, in high school, did you know, like, did you have a couple options to, for, for track and all that stuff? Where did you think you wanted to go? Well, I, uh, my dream was to go to Penn State. Oh. By far, my dream was to go to Penn State. And it was my number one choice. And I applied and the letter came back. And back then, you know, this is before you got emails, you actually get the letters. And it was, it was nerve wrackingly thin. You know, like usually when you get into a school, it's thick. And I remember getting this thin letter and it said, um, congratulations on your admittance to Penn State Altoona campus, which is <laughs> not good. It's like, and you have to spend at least two years, I think, in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And then you get, to, so uh, that fell through and I ended up going to, going to one of my second choices, Delaware, which ended gotcha. up with. Ended okay. Up with, mm -hmm. And were you a, like a journalism or broadcast major or any of those when you were I there? was a history major actually okay. in Delaware, but they, um. They didn't have journalism as a major. They had it as a like a concentration, and uh, but uh, for four years I worked for the student newspaper and like dove hardcore into student newspaper. And I had a lot of a lot of summer internships at different newspapers when I was in college. I was hyper passionate about journalism. Okay, and so what when you graduated? What was your first gig in in writing? So I got hired by the uh, the Nashville Tennessean, which is the daily newspaper in Nashville, as a uh, food and fashion writer. Oh my first job i knew nothing about either topic but i'd intern there and they liked my writing enough so i six days after graduating college i drove down put all my stuff in his car and my dad and i drove down to nashville and i started as a food and fat i knew nothing about the subjects but um yeah i did that for a while and then kind of found my way to high school wrestling and then got hired by sports Illustrated. what was it like going from basically i uh, guess it upstate new york kind of or is it it's an hour north yeah. of the city okay an and then you're now you're going to like nashville it's totally different lifestyle the thing is the biggest thing is i was a little asshole like i was a little cocky <laughs> i was just a cocky punk straight out of college thought okay. i was a shit uh -huh. thought i was be like the greatest writer and i showed up and i lived up to everyone's stereotypes of what a new york guy is like i was brash and cocky and um, i needed a lot of lessons like hard lessons of failure and disappointment and doing stupid things to kind of smack me around. And, and I was in Nashville for a little more, about two and a half years. And I, I, I bounced from food and fashion writer to music writer, to police beat, to um, high school wrestling. And I just kept screwing up, screwing up, screwing up. And ultimately, you know, you learn, as, you learn the most from your screw ups. I had a lot of screw ups in Nashville, but it kind of prepared me for my career. And then how did you get to transition to Sports Illustrated? That's a big jump. Yeah, it was a huge jump. I, um, my dream, starting when I was in a young high schooler, was to write for Sports Illustrated. And I used to tell my mom, I'm going to write for Sports Illustrated. And she'd be like, uh, you got to be realistic. Be a lawyer. Be a doctor. A very Jewish New York mother. Be a lawyer. Be a doctor. Oh, I'd be like, no, I'm, I'm going to write for Sports Illustrated. She didn't understand it because my family didn't care about sports at all. And um, basically, long story short, when I was a student at Delaware, um, I applied early for the NBA draft. I applied after my junior year at Delaware, but I didn't play college basketball. <laughs> I played intramuros. Okay. So I applied early just to see what would happen. It wasn't even my idea. It was the editor before me idea. He left. I just, I'm going to do this. I applied for the draft. One day I get a letter from, uh, I walk into my dorm room and my roommate's like, Hey Pearl, there's a letter from the NBA. And it was from the NBA saying, as of this date, we are, uh, you're renouncing your eligibility, blah, blah, blah. Then I'm home for winter break and I get a call from the NBA's head of security. And he's like, who the hell are you? And I'm like, oh, my name's Jeff. I'm a forward at Delaware. And I was a forward. I played for Edna's Edibles, an intramural team at the University of Delaware. And blah, 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 blah. So I ended up doing a story from my college paper. And when I, I was applying to Sports Illustrated, I was at the Tennessee and sending them letters, sending them letters. Finally, they're like, well, why don't you pitch us a story? And I pitched two stories they rejected. And the third story I pitched is why I applied early for the NBA draft without having ever played. And they said, write that. And uh, that was my first story in Sports Illustrated. And about six months after it ran, I got hired by the magazine. See, it all worked out. You, just because you didn't go to the NBA doesn't mean you, you're not going to Sports Illustrated. Yeah. That's yeah. huge, man. That's awesome. I've had, as you know, I've had, I mean, just from living out here, I'm sure you've read about it. I've had a, a very legendary pickup basketball career where, if, you know, say I average, I've averaged a solid six points and seven rebounds per game <laughs> in my pre-COVID outdoor basketball career. There you go. It's got to be yeah. tough right now. I was doing the same thing. I was playing pickup ball and can't, I'm playing a lot of golf now. I don't know. Are you, are you playing any golf? I don't play golf. No. But the, the weird thing is, I don't know if you've had this. I was playing, I've lived out here six years. I'd say 
some of the most enjoyable times I've had are Saturday morning pickup basketball at this court about two miles from my house, outdoor court, great court, great runs, really fantastic. And once COVID hit, I was like, I'm done. And about a month ago, I drove by, just coincidentally drove by the court, and I saw these guys still playing. I'm just going to be honest. I was like, what the hell? I didn't say it. I was just saying, what the hell are you people doing? Like, yeah. you know, there's a pandemic and it's really bad. You know, like the last thing I want to do is be on top of some guy. I don't really know. He's sweating on me. I'm sweating. Right. Like, it doesn't make any sense. So right. I have not played. I play with my son in the, in the front yard, but that's it. Okay. Gotcha. I know it's, it's tough right now. So hopefully sooner than later, you can get back out there. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you, um, even though you, you spent a decent amount of time at Sports Illustrated, but you decide to leave there and write your first big book, which of course is one of your childhood teams about the 86 Mets. How did, it, how did that go down where you were really ready to leave a big publication like that and go start writing a book? There's a little more to it. So basically, um, in uh, 2001, I was a baseball writer at SI. And I was like the number two guy. Tom Verducci was kind of the big gun, and I was like the number two guy. And it was the Diamondbacks and the Yankees were playing in the World Series that year. It's a legendary World Series. In the yeah, yeah. And um, one of the games at Yankee Stadium, um, I was sitting in the auxiliary press box next to Verducci and Steve Canella, who's now the editor of the magazine. And uh, my stomach was really bad. My stomach started cramping up. I don't know what I had, something. And I was like, I didn't have to write that day. I was like, I got to leave. Okay. So I took the subway back to my girlfriend's house. She's now my wife. I took the subway back to her house. And I'm on the couch, and it's a game which Scott Bros has hit an extra inning home run to win the game. It was a huge game, and people are going crazy. And I'm on her couch, and it's warm inside, and I'm sitting with her, and I'm probably eating like an apple and drinking or whatever. And I was so happy not to be at that game. Like, I was so happy to not be in the scrum afterwards, to not get the cliches, to not have the cameraman slamming the head trying to get Alfonso Soriano to say something. Like, it was just – and I was thinking, like – uh if, you, if you're a baseball writer and you're happy to miss one of the great World Series games of modern times, you probably shouldn't be a baseball writer. So around that time, I was approached actually by a book editor, by a book agent. And she said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I was like, I, not really. And she's like, have you ever thought about, what about the 86 Mets? Her name was Susan Reed. I was like, that's a great idea. And uh, I just started writing the book. I enjoyed the process a lot. And I just kind of settled, eventually settled on, I'm just going to try writing books full time. And what was it like? Because that team had some characters on it, obviously, Dwight Gooden and Daryl mm -hmm. Strawberry and Keith Hernandez, big name guys. What was it like for your first book to gather all? Because I, I know you're notorious for doing a ton of interviews. What was it like on the first one? I mean, book writing is really hard. I'm not, not trying to cry here. Like, no, yeah. It's hard and it beats the crap out of you. Like, it really beats the crap out of you. I could show you my office. My office is filled with... I and mean, this is, you know, I'm doing like a Bo Jackson book now, right? This is just like 1990, his 1990 Royal season. It's about whatever, I print out 200 pages. and I'm only up to June, July 1st, you know, like, and that's one sliver of one year of his life. Like, it's just like exhausting and exhaustive and you want to get it right and blah, blah, blah. So on the one hand, you can drive yourself crazy. You know, throwing a pandemic, you can really drive yourself crazy. But then on the other hand, like, I was 14 years old, 13 turning 14 during the 86 season. I was sitting in front of my TV with a mitt, pretending to be like Wally Backman or Rafael Santana. Now you're traveling around tracking these guys down. And it's almost like, uh, it's almost like going inside your TV, your 14 year old TV and seeing everything that's behind the scenes. And it was really freaking magical, you know? And, and it, it was a, one thing I learned during that process is, the Bat Boys were amazing. Like the Bat Boys gave me ridiculously good information. And that was a good lesson for me for books that because Gooden, one Gooden or Strawberry, one of them was in jail. And I think one might've been in rehab at the time. So I didn't get to talk to either of them. You kind of think, well, how can you write this book without them? Yeah. Well, you find everyone who was there and you talk to them. So that's what I did. And it's just like the Bat Boys, the clubhouse guys, the PR people. And, uh, you know, it was great. It was great. It was really fun. That is cool. Yeah, that's a good, good way to start. And you, you learn how to structure your books like that after. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about a couple more of your books just before we get to the Lakers, and we'll have plenty mm -hmm. on that. Um, I, I did read on your website that you said that writing the book about Walter Payton called Sweetness, the Enigmatic Life of Walter Payton was the hardest, most rewarding, painful, yet joyful book you've ever written. Why did all those emotions come out when you're writing about Walter Payton? Um, I mean, I'd say, first of all, because... Uh, 
it's like you, uh, you really become obsessive when you write these books. Like you really become obsessive. Like every day and then I'm like, anyone want to talk about Bo Jackson? And they're like, no, no one in this house wants to talk about Bo Jackson. With Walter Payton, I was really obsessed. And it has a horribly tragic ending, like a horribly tragic ending and a horribly sad ending. And you're traveling through a person's life um, at warp speed, but you're traveling through their life. So I'm starting and he's born in Columbia, Mississippi. And you're, you feel in a way like you're there reconstructing these moments and then i'm at jackson state when he's in college and the blooming of this star and here he is he's a rookie in chicago and he's never seen snow before and this whole thing and like and then he has his he's in he's it's a super bowl and he's sad because he didn't score a touchdown and he's in a broom closet crying even though they won and then he's retired and he doesn't really know what to do with himself and then he gets sick and then he dies and it just, the ride is so all consuming. And so he had so many highs and lows and goods and bads. And he was so complicated. Like I did, I did Roger Clemens's biography. He wasn't very complicated. I didn't think I thought he was a pretty <laughs> simple man. Um, I always make the joke. Like if you could read his brain scan, it'd be baseball, food, baseball, breasts, baseball, food, baseball, breasts. Like that's it. <laughs> And I think Walter Payton had all these like doubts and fears and concerns and worries and it made him really fascinating. But it, I just, I remember one night taking a run through New Rochelle, New York, where I used to live. And just like, I was, it was almost like I was tripping where I felt like he was running next to me in his kangaroo headband and a sweatsuit. And it just like, it got really, uh, you know, it's almost like sometimes you go to a place you shouldn't go. And that's kind of where I felt like I was. That's crazy. Wow. And since you brought up Roger Clemens, I was going to ask you about, because you also wrote a book about Barry Bonds, you know, two very polarizing baseball players. What I, did you have? What did what can you tell me about writing the book about Bonds too? I mean, Bonds was fascinating. So Bonds at least is interesting. You know, yeah. like they're both kind of douchebags, but Bonds at least <laughs> is interesting. Yeah. And Bonds, I mean, to cover Barry Bonds, because I covered him a lot when I was at Sports Illustrated. He was just terrifying. Like he was terrifying because you never knew where you were going to get. And he owned that clubhouse and they treated him. It was so preposterous. He had his own wall. Like he didn't just have his own locker. He had his own, his own wall. Wow. His own recliner, his own flat screen, big TV, his own masseuse, his two own PR people. And it was all about his ego. You know, he was a lot like, honestly, this is going to sound weird not to get political. He reminds me of Trump a lot. He really does. When I, he did something that Trump does really well whether you like Trump or don't like Trump, like he walked right through things. Like Barry Bonds just walked right through things. It was like, Barry, we have a PR team for the Giants. And he'd be like, no, I have my own people. Okay. Barry, we have a team photographer. No, I want mine in the locker room. Okay. Like he just learned. If you just walk past people, what can that's they all do? you have to do. That's yeah. all you have to do if you're in a position of power. And he's very good at that. Trump's very good at that. Um, when I was working the book, I, this is my, my weirdest Bond story. And I used to tell it all the time. And I don't tell it anymore. But um, I had interviewed... He played at Arizona State. And one of his teammates at Arizona State was a guy named Jose Rodiles. And um, I interviewed Jose. And then I went up to Bonds finally. I basically accumulated all this information, went up to Bonds to give him a last chance to talk to me because I'd been told he wouldn't cooperate. So I go up to him as a locker and I tiptoe up to him. And you had to tiptoe up to him because it was so pathetic. And I was like, hey, uh, hey, Barry. So, so my name is Jeff Perlman. I've interviewed you before. I just want you to know, I'm finishing up this book, and I, uh, I go, I would love to talk to you. I just want to give you another last opportunity. And he was nice. He goes, you know what? I appreciate you doing that, but I'm not going to talk. And I said, well, just so you know, I have interviewed tons of people. I interviewed this person, that person. I said, I even talked to Jose Rodiles. And he goes, man, I don't even know who that is. So I think the next day I called Jose Rodiles. And I was like, it's kind of weird, but Barry Bond says he doesn't know who you are. And Jose Rodiles goes, doesn't know who I am. Uh, the guy was in my fucking wedding. And it's hard to explain, but that's just Bonds. Like he, 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 he took joy in making your life harder. It's the best way I've explained it. He took joy wow. in making your life harder. And he just, that was him. He was not a likable human being. Maybe, I think he's gotten more likable in retirement. Something about maybe the chemicals and all that. I don't even know. He just wasn't likable. And Clemens was much more likable than Bonds, I think. Um, but he was just full of shit. You know, like, he, <laughs> like you played yeah. baseball for a long time. Yeah. Like, these guys cheated. Like, factually, yeah. they cheated. Like, right. And they continue to lie about it and continue to lie about it. Like, it's so dumb now because it's so freaking obvious you did. Yeah. Why not just admit it at this point? I mean, 
you're not supposed to get better after you turn 35, you know? <laughs> Wait, and let me say the other thing. Yeah. All right, I'm happy to talk to you. I want to say one thing to you. Sure, sure. Because it's good to talk to someone who played. This is something that has driven me crazy for years. I, call, I think of it as the Nelson Cruz thing, okay? Here's Nelson Cruz. He's a really good hitter. He tests positive. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, blah, 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 blah. He leaves. Now, in a normal world where everything is fair, he comes back and he's not using it anymore. And he's a lesser player. He comes back, Cano, when he came back, they're just as good as they were before. They are performance-enhancing drugs for a reason. It right. makes no sense. And everyone's just like, wow, comeback player of the year. This is great. Nelson Cruz. It's like, you idiots. His size hasn't changed. His productivity hasn't changed. Do you really not think he's not using? And that right. shit drives me freaking crazy. For sure. No, I totally agree with you. And for someone that didn't use the PEDs, it is frustrating because you guys will make it that maybe you wouldn't have. They were fringe players, and you don't get that opportunity because some of these guys were, were using like that. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I know it's off topic, but um, I had a really good friend. He's still a friend. His name was Sal Fasano, and he was a journeyman. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. Great guy. One of the few like, people I consider a friend from my days covering baseball players. And Sal... Late in his career, he was just a journeyman catcher, you know. Late in his career, he hung on longer than he should have because his son was born with a heart defect and he wanted the major league health plan, right? And he hung on and he hung on and he hung on. He played in the minors and, you know, he was battered and blah, blah, blah. And I always think, like, when the Mitchell Report came out, there were about 10 catchers who were just like Sal Fasano in the Mitchell Report. Guys like, I don't remember who it was, maybe Gary Bennett or Paula Dewey, whatever, Todd Pratt, guys like yeah. that. They're all that back up to mid marginal starter level. And I always think like Sal, who I knew really well, I've had talks with him. He's like, I never cheated. I just didn't think it was right. And like, here's this guy trying to do it the right way so he can get freaking health insurance for a sick kid. Yeah. And you're cheating. And when people are like, oh, it's not a big deal. I'm like, yeah, it is a big deal because there are people like you, like Sal Fasano, who decided to do it the right way. And it just yeah. pisses me off. Yeah. Still pisses me off when I talk about it. For sure. No, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And I mean, they're trying to clean the game up, but it, it just it sucks when, when guys don't make it because of that. And since we're on there, I know, see, we, this, is, this is what happens when you bring up good stuff. I saw your, your favorite player is Ken Griffey Jr., uh, and so is mine. Um, Ken Griffey Sr. was my favorite oh, player. Oh, Sr. Sorry. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. So but I, I love covering Jr. Junior. I okay. love covering Jr. Yeah. Right. And so I was just curious because some people say, and it's – bonds with steroids or not he could be the best player of all time i like to lean griffey because there isn't that hanging over his head but what are your thoughts on on those two bonds griffey yeah well in my bonds book i actually um there was a moment when bond so bonds and griffey used to be tight i don't even think they talk anymore not for any reason i just you move on in life but they used yeah. to be very tight and there is um i have this in my book in my bonds book there was a moment when Bonds and Griffey were together, and it was after the uh, McGuire Sosa season, and it was so preposterous inside baseball. I mean, everyone knew; those players knew what was going on, right? Yeah. And Bonds is, you know, I mean, with or without, I'd say Bonds is clearly a more talented natural player than Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa. I don't think it's even a debatable argument. And yeah. and uh, Bonds says to Griffey at one point, he's like, "This is just bullshit. These guys are getting paid huge money." It's obvious they're doing it. I'm going to try, see where it takes me, blah, 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 blah. And Griffey decided not to. Um, and I just think that's a moment. Like, I'm very strongly anti-Bonds in the Hall of Fame. Very strongly anti-Bonds yeah. in the Hall of Fame. And I think that's a moment. Bonds could have been, if Bonds had remained the guy he was in Pittsburgh, presumably not using, he still goes down as one of the 15 greatest outfielders of all time. That's yeah. Hall of Fame. Yeah. He just decided not to. He decided to go dark. So, right. to me... I like to think Griffey didn't use. I don't know for sure, but I like right. to think he didn't use. But to me, he goes down as a greater player. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I, I totally agree. Um, I know. I know. We're getting. We, I want to get to the Lakers because I got a lot. Of I love talking this stuff. I like <laughs> okay, this stuff okay. more than Lakers. So oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Well, I wanted to ask you just because it was arguably your best books, according to a lot of people, was the Brett Favre book called Gunslinger. I just wanted to ask you what it was like to write that book. He's had a lot of ups and downs and his timing in Atlanta, then Green Bay. What was it like to write the book on Brett Favre? It's so funny. I, um, it's probably the book I think of the less, the least. Oh, I don't know why. Okay. Like if you said, if you said name all your books you've written, I really, but that's not, I didn't want to write the book, first of all. Like my, my dream in life was to write a book about the USFL, the old football league, which, which I wrote did, after right? Favre. Yeah. yeah, I wrote it after Favre. And the only reason I wrote the Favre book is 
I couldn't get a USFL deal. So I start, I thought, well, maybe if I pitch a bigger book and attach the USFL book. So a company, Hald Mifflin, Hald Mifflin agreed, but they said you have to write far book first. And I freaking loved it. Like I loved it. It was one of my favorite projects. I'm, it's funny. I'm a, I'm a liberal Jewish New York, California guy. And I love the state of Mississippi. I love visiting Mississippi. I love the cultures of Mississippi. I love the people of Mississippi. Love. And Walter Payton took me to Mississippi and then Favre took me to Mississippi. Wow. And yeah, I love it. I love Mississippi. And it's funny. I don't think you can, you can make an argument that Brett Favre is the greatest quarterback of all time, but Favre, Jerry Rice, Walter Payton, all from Mississippi. It's pretty crazy. That is uh, crazy. In that state. Yeah. Um, this is where I always, this is a story. I, I mean, when I think of Mississippi and that experience with Favre is, so I didn't know if he was going to talk to me and he wound up not talking to me for the book. Okay. And I reached out to his sister, Brandy on Facebook one day. I just found her on Facebook and I said, Hey, my name's Jeff, but I'm working on a book, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and I was planning on going to Mississippi to do some reporting. I said, if I come down, would you be willing to have coffee with me? And she wrote back literally DM on Facebook. She's like, uh, well, let me know when you're down here and hopefully we can meet up. So I get down, I'm literally in my hotel room in the kill, wherever Mississippi, maybe Hattiesburg. And um, I DM her and I'm like, hey, this is Jeff and I'm here and you want to get coffee? And she's like, well, my mom and I are at the house. Why don't you just come to the house? I'm like, okay. So I drive to the Favre house and this is the home where Brett grew up. And now the mom still lives there. And I drive to the child, Brett Favre's childhood home and the mom's there and the sister's there. And the mom's name is Benita. I love Benita Favre. <laughs> She's like, uh, so has Brett agreed to talk to you? And I'm like, uh, no, not yet. And usually that's it. Usually that's, that's it. She goes, okay, what do, you, what do you want to know? And I was there for maybe three hours, and they sent me home with scrapbooks. And Brett Favre's childhood uh, high school scrapbooks, like clips. Wow. And I'm driving away from the house, and I call my wife, and I'm like, uh, this is crazy. I just spent three hours with Brett Favre, blah, blah, blah. I'm, home, I'm coming home with scrapbooks. And she goes, don't you think that's weird? I was like, what do you mean? She's like, he's not even talking to you. And they send you home with his scrapbooks. And I said, you just have to understand Mississippi a little bit and the kindness and the warmth and the richness. Right. So uh, yeah, it was, that was a really, really enjoyable book for me to write. It really, that's cool. He was such a great teammate. He was basically Shaq in the NFL. Right. Marvin Shaq are become very similar. Right. And he was just a, a real joyful human being to write about. Yeah. It seems like he always was having the most fun on the field when you watch him play. So that's cool Definitely. that you got to do that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Shaq, now I can get to the good stuff, right? I okay. mean, if you want to talk baseball, we can do that too. But Hey, whatever I, you want. Okay. Well, this, just because it was a huge book and this is like my era. Okay. I grew up, I was a kid watching, you know, the, the Kobe Shaq Lakers and this is a big deal. But I did want to ask you, so you've written two Laker books now. You wrote one on Showtime and now you're writing one on this era. How did you decide you wanted to do these, these two projects? Well, so Showtime just seemed like a really good idea. I know that sounds basic, but it just seemed like a really good idea. You always think um, characters. So you got Magic, you have Kareem, Riley. Those are three big characters, just like Shaq, Kobe, Phil, or three big right, characters. Right, right. You think about the era, you know, Bird, Isaiah, Dr. J, just like, Big Jordan's, era. yeah. Just Jordan. Like, yeah. But Jordan was just coming in then. You know, it was right. early Jordan, but yeah. So that book just felt like a really and also growing up in New York, I was really mesmerized by Southern California. Like I remember watching Lakers Celtics and they would show the palm trees and they'd zoom in on the forum and the Laker girls. And right. it just it's it did something to me. It really did something to me. So so that book, I just thought, this is a really good topic. The recent book, Three Ink Circus, um, I really enjoyed that first project a lot. Like, I, I enjoyed the Lakers. I enjoyed Jeannie Buss and Linda Ramis and the whole thing. And it just felt, this is almost too much information, but um, I always think about nostalgia. Like, I, I am a big nostalgist, a sports nostalgist. And the thing about nostalgia is it moves. Like, it, it moves as we get older. It gets, it moves up too. So there aren't that many people left who are nostalgic for, certainly not for like Mantle and Maze. Like that's a really, now you're really, and even, I don't know anymore, 70s baseball. Like are people nostalgic for the 77, 78 Yankees? Not as much as they used to be. Right. And so I consider 80s, 90s now really the money spot for nostalgia, you know, because it moves. So I just thought this team 
there was it were, enough time had passed that there's a nostalgia to it. And for me personally, nostalgia is a driving force in writing books. I mean, that's huge. And obviously, you know, unfortunately, you know, Kobe had passed this past year, which is, which sucks, but um, you know, at least this is, you know, there's, this is like the, the early Kobe. So we got that part and I want to, we'll do a big topic on Kobe later, but I want to get to some of the stories in the book. So um, you have some great ones. And actually the book just jumps right into a story about Kobe and Samaki Walker, of course, mm-hmm. when they were shooting half court shots and Kobe was collecting money after he won. So I wanted you to, to talk about that story. Well, so I had read somewhere about it. It's not like I'm the first to write okay. about it. There was, there was talk about this fight between Kobe and Samaki and what happened and blah, blah, blah. But there wasn't that much on it. So I ended up meeting Samaki Walker, who's a great guy and lives out here in Southern California. Um, I think I met him in Encino at okay. a coffee shop. And I asked him about, the, about it and he just blah, 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 blah. Just told the whole story, told a great, um, you know, basically they used to do these half court shot contest before uh, games at shoot around and everyone put in a hundred bucks you know it's nba money i put a hundred bucks it's like me putting in a nickel for right, right. You know? and um and th- on this day kobe won and everyone paid him but samaki walker didn't have the money and then later he didn't have the money and the next day he didn't have the money he's on the bus and finally kobe's you know says samaki where's my money yeah i don't give kobe shut up i don't have it where's my motherfucking money and then punches him on the bus. And these Samaki Walker is a big guy. He's, I don't know, 6'9", six, 6'10", six, bigger than Kobe. I think Samaki's Walker, he says to Jelani McCoy, he's like, did this fucker just punch me? He's like, yeah, man, he did. And Shaq's standing right there, and Shaq's like, you got to beat his ass. And he, asked, uh, he said to Phil Jackson, stop the bus, stop the bus. And he called Kobe out, and Kobe wouldn't get off the bus. And then later, Kobe Bryant calls him in tears, sobbing. And I just thought the story, I mean, I never thought of this book as a Kobe Shack book, but it, certainly you can argue it's kind of a Kobe Shack book. And it sort of that story spoke to me of the, this effort Kobe was always making, kind of sad in a way, to be something, to have an image or a rep. And right there, you know, he wasn't going to fight Samaki Walker. He was ass kicked by Samaki Walker, but he, he had this rep he had to keep up. And it's just, that was kind of, that story really spoke to me. So. Yeah, no, that's it was crazy. And it, and it brings you really into who Kobe was in this book and kind of the villain almost in this book, really, just as the young, immature kid, um, you know, and which is, you know, a lot, of, at least my age group, like I wouldn't have known any of this stuff. I was too young to, to know that Kobe. Um, but I, I want like to ask you're just trying to make me look, you're trying to make me feel old, aren't you? No, 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 I need you to tell me the stories. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, for us NBA junkies who remember the role players that played with the, the Lakers, even in the mid nineties before Kobe got there, I wanted to ask you about Cedric Sabalos. So there, of course, or was it that he nicknamed himself club said, is that right? Well, Chice. Oh, Chice. That's right. That's right. Chice. The, the franchise or whatever, right? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, because this was in that weird period where magic kind of came back. He's almost done the night. The Lakers are looking for their next star. So what was the story about how Cedric Sabalos just basically disappeared and his whole, the whole deal with him? Well, so that was kind of an awesome year. That was basically the year before they drafted Shaq and I mean, drafted Kobe and brought Shaq in. Right. And magic comes back and it's, it's not good. I mean, like the idea of it seems good, but he's now kind of power forward magic and he's ego, big ego magic. And he, you know, he doesn't understand why these kids in their hippity hop aren't respecting him. You know, it's like <laughs> grandpa showing up at the barbecue and saying in my day, he, there was a lot of in my day. Right. And Sabayus was, the guy whose playing time was most affected by affected by magic returning. And one day he just doesn't show up. Somebody is like, I'm just, I'm, he just doesn't show up and they have no idea where he is. He's basically jet skiing at a lake. And, you know, he was a captain. He was actually the captain of the Lakers, a co-captain of the Lakers. And they stripped him of his captainship. And that year, I mean, Sabayos was a nightmare. He did nickname himself Chice for franchise. I remember Corey Blount who was on that team. He was a former Laker. He's like, to me, I forgot what he said, but it's basically like, it takes a lot of stones to nickname yourself Chice. Yeah. Especially when you're like, this is the organization of Kareem, Magic, West, Elgin Baylor, Will Chamberlain, you know, like Chice. Yeah. You're basically a, a very good role player who plays no defense. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like the dark, the dark in between, between Magic, leave, Magic retiring and Shaq and Kobe showing up. Right, yes. And so I did want to ask you about, 
when Kobe does finally, you know, they do the draft day trade, but you had a really cool story about how he could have gone to the New Jersey Nets in that draft, your mm -hmm. former hometown team. Uh, and how I want to ask you about how Jerry West pulled this whole thing off. And John Calipari was the coach of the New Jersey Nets at the time, and he almost picked Kobe. So what happened with Jerry West, and how did he get Kobe to the Lakers? I mean, the whole thing was kind of genius and speaks to the, the brilliance that was Jerry West as an executive. And also that, in a way, it also speaks to the a changing NBA where the players were now becoming the power players as opposed to owners becoming power players and GMs becoming power players. So. Kobe, when he was a senior in high school or after his senior year, <coughs> excuse me, um, signed a shoe deal with Adidas and agreed he would jump to the NBA. And um, Adidas really wanted him in a major market, not East Rutherford, New Jersey. Right. The Nets play. And the, the Nets worked him out four or five times and loved him. Just thought he was great. And Jerry West and the Lakers worked him out twice and loved him. And thought he was great. He decimated a guy named Dante, Dante Jones out of Mississippi State. And then he decimated Michael Cooper, who was 40, but, you know, decimated him in these workouts. And Jerry West said, it's the best workouts I've ever seen a guy have. So Arn Tellum is Kobe's agent. And it's really funny. Like, that. Adidas wants him in L.A. Arn Tellum wants him in L.A. Kobe probably doesn't really care, but he's happy to go to L.A. Um, and John Calipari and John Nash, the general manager of the Nets, really are going to, they're going to draft him. Number eight, we're drafting Kobe Bryant. So um, they call Kobe's parents and they're like, we're going to draft Kobe. This is a couple of days before the draft. And the parents are Jelly Bean and, and Linda are like, great, that's great, great. We can go up and see him. Day before the draft, John Calipari gets a call from Kobe. And he says, you know, coach, I really want to get away from my parents. Um, I prefer you don't draft me. Calipari, Goes into John Nash, the GM's office, like, holy shit, holy fuck, what the hell are we going to do, blah, blah. John Nash is like, Cal, calm down. It's all just a bluff. Don't worry. But then Arn Tellum calls, Kobe's agent. He's like, you know, we don't, we don't want you drafting Kobe. He doesn't want to play for you guys. Calipari, oh, shit, what the fuck are we going to do? John Nash is like, it's all bluffing, each other, blah. Kerry Kittles is coming out of Villanova. His agent's David Falk. And uh, David Falk calls. John Calipari and says, you know, Cal, Kerry really wants to play with you guys. If he's there at number eight and you don't draft him, I'm really going to have to think about never bringing any of my clients to you ever again. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Shit, shit, shit. Okay. Now, the funny thing is John Nash is the general manager, but Calipari in his contract has final personnel say. So the morning of the draft, they have a team like breakfast or whatever, or dinner, I don't know what it was. Calipari stands up and he says, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. If Kerry Kittles is there at number eight, we're taking Kerry. If not, we're taking Kobe Bryant. And John Nash just knows. He just knows. And uh, Jerry West and the Charlotte Hornets, who pick at 13, already had a deal worked out that – because he West was dealing with Tellum, and he knew he was being fed the information. And they had a deal that if Kobe falls to number 13, we'll swap Vladi Divac for him. They knew the guys, 9, 10, 11, 12, weren't interested in Kobe, those teams. He goes to number 13. The swap is made. The Nets wind up with Kerry Kittles, who is a, you know. Good player. Yeah, good. Yeah. You, can, you can, if Kerry Kittles is your third scorer, you're, you're okay. Right. But, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a crazy, That's, great, great story. Wow. That is awesome. Um, and while we're on the topic of Jerry West, I did want to ask you, you know, I, I, I did ask a couple of people, my dad, he wanted to hear about this. So whatever you got on it would be great. The dynamic between Phil Jackson and Jerry West. It, yeah. He wanted to hear about Jerry, you know, behind the scenes and all that stuff. And then Del Harris was a coach and he got phased out and then Rambus was there. And then Phil, what, and I know Phil didn't really like, according to your book, didn't really like Jerry that much having him in the locker room and stuff like that. So what was the dynamic between Jerry West and Phil Jackson? So West didn't want to hire Phil Jackson. He, and that's not like some gossipy thing. He just factually didn't want to hire him. He wanted to stick with Kurt Rambus. He thought Kurt Rambus was going to be a really good coach and he was a Laker and blah, blah, blah. Right. And Jerry Buss was like, and wisely, you have to say, was like, we, I want a marquee coach. I want this guy. He's available. Um, and also, the, uh, Phil Jackson had kind of been undermining Rambus and Dell Harris a little. He'd been making comments in the paper and blah, blah, blah. And it just pissed him everyone off. So Jess call, uh, Jerry West calls him. And Phil, they have a nice phone conversation, blah, blah, blah. And he agrees to hire him. And he knows he's a good coach. It's not like Jerry West is dumb. He knows the guy's a good coach. Yeah. But he just, you know, it was like 
Jerry West is such a fascinating guy. He's really one of my favorites. He's very sensitive. For a guy who's had that much success, he's very, very sensitive and very, very aware. And there was one moment, it's kind of famous by now, Phil written about in his book too, where Jerry West walks into the locker room after a game. He enters a little bit early. He didn't realize it. And Phil just chews him out in front of the entire team. And it was really embarrassing for him, like significantly embarrassing for him. And he ultimately left shortly thereafter. He just never – Phil Jackson, I love Phil Jackson. He was great for this book. He's a really nice guy. He had a huge ego. And for someone with a huge ego, it can't be easy having a Jerry West hovering above. You know, and Jerry West just wanted to kind of be involved and, you know, uh, engage with his coach. And it just wasn't Phil Jackson's way, really. So it just was never great, you know, never six, great. A six-time like, uh, champion, yeah. Yeah, they're both good people. Like, I don't – I don't think they're yeah, bad people. It just wasn't, right. wasn't going to work. Just didn't work. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get to, to Shaq actually now. So, uh, you know, when I was growing up, the movie Kazam came out, of course, loved it. You know, he's fun. He's got the great personality. Another underrated movie is Blue Chips with him and Penny. I thought that was an awesome movie. You, are you not a fan of that movie? No, I'm not. I thought it was great. What? I thought it was cool. It was like before he got game, that was like the, this is what happens in college basketball. You know what I mean? I will say, I think it's a better movie than he got game. Actually. Okay. Yeah, it's, they're both, I, th- I like them both. But yeah, so anyway, but Shaq was good in that. You could just see he was kind of, he had that star quality. He's charismatic. Right. And I wanted to ask you about how, because there's that, the whole deal with Shaq was the Orlando Sentinel had that poll yeah. and it was, is Shaq worth the money? And Jerry West was able to pull another move off to get Shaq to LA. So uh, can you speak to kind of what happened with that in Orlando and how did they lose out on Shaquille O'Neal? I mean, a lot of reasons. Number one, I just think, it's not even just, I think, like the, the Orlando Magic, so they were run by the DeVos family, made uh, somewhat infamous or famous, depending on your slam, by Betsy DeVos, the current Secretary of Education. Um, and they were very, very – racist is a wrong word. Maybe it's the right word. But they were definitely – they definitely thought the players should feel lucky to be playing for them. Okay. You know, like, they definitely felt the players should be – should have this gratitude. and that Shaq should be thankful to the magic that he has his job and he's playing for the Orlando magic and blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, again, it was a transitioning time for players and players weren't that way anymore. It wasn't like, it was less and less of he's my owner, which has always been an ugly labeling anyway. Yeah. And more of this is a guy who's paying my bills and maybe next week he won't be paying my bills. So the magic were not great with African-American players at all. They just weren't. There was this air of weirdness. and. Shaq's agent really wanted Shaq to go to L.A. Thought marketing, everything. From the day Shaq was drafted out of last year, he wanted him to go to L.A. Um, then the, the 96 Olympic team is practicing in Orlando at Disney, and the Orlando Sentinel comes out with this poll. And the poll was, is Shaquille O'Neal worth $110 million? It's such a poorly worded poll because nobody's worth $110 million. In, the, in and of itself, you know what I mean? Like, right. The proper way to, I've said this before, the proper way to ask that question is the Orlando Magic made X amount of money last year. Is Shaquille O'Neal worth $110 million? Like, you have to have some context to it. Nobody's worth $110 million. That's a ridiculous amount of money. So 90-something percent said no. Poll comes out, Shaq's in Orlando. All these other players are dogging about it. Um, and then, at the same time, Jerry West and the Lakers clearly want him. And they want him, and they woo him, and the Magic are kind of lowballing him, and the Lakers are offering a lot of money. And they're going back and forth. And on the one hand, Shaq wants to stay. He's comfortable in Orlando, but not really. And, uh, Jerry West made one move. It's just – it's a small little thing that's gone overlooked in history. But he needed to ante up a little more money to get to the final price. And he calls Stu Jackson, who is the general manager of the Vancouver Grizzlies, then Vancouver. And he offers uh, George Lynch and Anthony Peeler, who are basically their seventh and eighth men and good NBA players, for two second round picks. And he just wants to do it to get rid of the contract so he can add more into the Shaq pool. Right. And um, Stu Jack, the other NBA GMs, like Stu Jackson, is the, he's not really conflicted, but it's made clear to him, don't help them like this. Like, don't help the Lakers like this. But Stu Jackson's team, I think they won 15 games a year before. He's like, these are two players who will start for me right now. Yeah. He makes a deal, Lakers free up the money, and basically they end up with Shaq, you know? 
when you say it was he worth it, I mean back then, you know, people weren't getting the hundred million dollar contracts, but Alonzo Morning got that a similar and Juwan Howard and Juwan Howard, Howard, right? And Shaq's like, I, I'm at least if not better than both of those two guys, or more valuable. So also, I mean, I don't know if you saw this in your baseball career as much. Yeah. Like it is, um, it's probably not the same in baseball at least in minor league. I don't even know, but like there was so much ego back then about who makes the most. It's like the whole Shaq Kobe thing and who's getting the respect and whose team is it and who's the who's the alpha? Like that you hear that a million times. Who's the alpha? Yeah. And I always think to myself, who gives a fucking shit? Like <laughs> you're both making millions of dollars to put a ball in a rim. It is a beautiful you fly first class, you stay in the nicest hotels in America, you are world famous, you can live anywhere you want, you only work part of the year, you have your summers off. Like, who cares? Who cares? If you're making a hundred, like Shaq, I love Shaq. I love Shaq. Yeah. But like, you need to make more money than Alonzo Mourning because of respect. Like, give me a, yeah. really? Like, you're going to make $110 million. Who cares if he makes 112? What difference does it make? Right. It's so stupid and babyish, but it just was kind of, you get in that pool and it's just, you know, you got to swim. Or even as simple as a newspaper poll coming out and saying, are you worth the money? Like that made him, that started the move that you know what i mean like something to your point something so small now it's just they're, at the end of the day they're human and they can get they're sensitive about stuff but it's crazy if you told me like so i have a writing podcast and if i found out if i'm making 100 million to do my podcast and i found out you're making 110 million i'm not jealous of that i'm pretty happy with my 100 million right. i don't need to make 100 at what point are you okay with what you right. get right i'm good yeah <laughs> uh i, I want to talk about i think actually besides the kobe shack drama in your book the role players, it kind of had a last dance feel to it where you went through some of these role players. Yeah. You know, you talked about Eddie Jones, Nick Van Exel, Rick Fox, and uh, ironically, and Robert Ory. Yeah. I didn't realize Robert Ory, Big Shot Bob, had some interesting altercations before he got to the Lakers. And, and I see him now. He's an analyst. He seems like a great guy. You know, he yeah. made some big shots to Lakers. But he was unhappy in Phoenix. He left the, the champion uh, Rockets teams. What did, you, what did you uncover about Robert Ory in your, in your search? Well, no, I mean, it's – it's kind of a cool yeah, – he was a really good shooter at Houston, and he's very happy in Houston. And he also has a uh, – he had a daughter who was born with a really bad disease, and she was in Houston. The wife was in Houston. And he gets traded to Phoenix. And Phoenix is winless when he's in Phoenix, and he hates Danny Ainge, a coach. and He's just miserable. He's just miserable in Phoenix. And one day he's coming off the court, and Ainge says something to him, and he, or he takes a towel and throws it in his face. Which I got to say, by modern standards, doesn't really seem like that big a deal. But it was like, oh, my God. And yeah. So, I mean, to the Lakers, great delight. They get them, and they have, all they have to give up is Cedric Ceballos. That's right. Cedric Ceballos got traded. They swapped problems. Yeah. Like the, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a terrific trade. I mean, it's an all-time. Oh. People don't think of it with the all-time trades, but it's an all-time great trade. And, um, you know, Ori was really – he was one of those guys. Like the, I always thought – the reason I'm so into role players, especially with the Lakers – I just really thought the way they built those teams was so smart. Like, um, you look at when Shaq and Kobe first get there, those are probably the most physically talented teams they played on with the Lakers because Van Exel was awesome. Eddie Jones was awesome. Eldon Campbell was really good. And Ceballos was actually really talented, right? When, so, talent-wise, just talent-wise, those are probably the best teams. But it was like the way they built uh, Rick Fox, Robert Ory, a pass is prime Brian Shaw, a pass is prime Horace Grant, Derek Harper, it just a lot of really like pieces. They're all about pieces. Right. Mark Madsen, you know, he was a piece. You know, I was going to ask you about him. Yeah. He was just a piece. Mike Penberthy from Masters College. He's right. Like, Tyron Liu, a piece. Like they, it was almost like Jerry West understood. Like right now in the NBA, guys are trying, we're trying to figure out where James Harden's going to go. Right. And there's some talk he might go to Brooklyn. That would be a freaking nightmare and a disaster because it's not always about having the most top level talent. Right. It's about building this global sort of thing and jerry west was really smart and phil jackson was really smart about the way they built and handled so all those role players that they wound up getting were just and or is a great example which is great parts of a, of, a, of a whole yeah and one of them i mean just to run the triangle people liked having i'm not a huge Derek fisher guy but he was there to run the triangle and he was you know some people liked him better than van exel because you know his less attitude or whatever and then gary payton eventually came in and they'd rather have Derek fisher but just, yeah, you're right. It's simple little pieces of these guys that you got. Well, um, if you think about it, if Nick Van Exel, and in, in his prime Nick Van Exel, and in his prime Derek Fisher played one-on-one -on -one right. 100 times, Nick Van Exel wins 98 of those games. Right. 
And in, in his prime, Gary Payton plays. And in his, in his prime, Derek Fisher, he probably wins 100 of those. You know, like Derek Fisher is not beating either of those guys one-on-one. Yeah. But he was the perfect triangle point guard. Yeah. Like he wasn't, he was an average NBA player, maybe a little above average, but he was perfect for that system. You know, a lot of those guys are just perfect for the system. Right. And since you brought up Mad Dog, Mark Madsen, I got to ask you about him. So he and Shaq had a really cool relationship. And I, I wanted to ask you about what you, what you learned about Mark Madsen in, in the book and in your, in your uh, interviews and stuff like that. So, yeah, I love Mark Madsen. And um, actually, this is when I learned the Lakers organization has changed a little bit, not for the better. I was, I was trying to get a Madsen interview. It was a couple of years ago. He was, he was an assistant coach with the Lakers at the time. And Lakers PR staff was just a pain in the ass, this whole book just a pain there's this change and um they're finally like all right you can come up and talk to Mads and it's after practice they don't have a game the next day they're not traveling I'm sitting there talking to Mads and he could not be better he could not be happier loves talking about this stuff he has nowhere to go and I see the PR person behind him it's been like 15 minutes going like this like end the interview like you've had enough time with Mark Madsen and the old Lakers would have never done that right and it's just, I just find that stuff infuriating, you know? Yeah. Um, Madsen's great. He, another, like, was he a particularly good NBA player? Not really. He was just a grinder and a guy, yeah. you know, a lot of guys like him. But um, Shaq loved him. Shaq, you know, I wrote about this a lot, you know, Mark Madsen, Mormon, you know, I don't know if he was a virgin. My guess would be yes, but he shows up in Lakers and Shaq is just, Going around whenever they're on the flight, asking flight attendants, hey, are you Mormon? You Mormon? You Mormon? My boy here. You Mormon? You Mormon? Uh, you know, bought him his first suits in LA, just took him out, never paid for a meal. You know, more Mats would never pay for a meal. I'm telling you, I think Shaq, I, I mentioned Brett Favre earlier. You did. In chill writing about Shaq, I think Favre was the best teammate I've ever written about, superstar, but Shaq was a different level. You know, he just really was. He just wanted to make people happy. Yeah, and I, even the part, even the small part in your book about speaking of Shaq being a good teammate is like Eric Chenoweth, that center. He just Shaq invited him oh, into yeah. his house, had him over a party, like very welcoming to everybody. He was he was amazing. I mean, that was um, Chenoweth was basically an he was a free agent. I'd been a journeyman, you know, D League bunch of teams. Lakers sign him to fight for the backup center spot with Jamal Sampson. Shaq is having a welcome to LA party for uh, for Malone and Payton. This is before the season. He's never met Eric Chenoweth. He, he would not recognize Eric Chenoweth if he saw him. And one day Eric Chenoweth gets his invitation mail on granite. It's, uh, it comes in the mail on like granite, engraved, his name engraved. You are invited to blah, blah, blah. Shows up, Shaq's house. She walks up to Shaq. Hey, Shaq, I'm Eric Chenoweth. Yo, E-Dog, so happy to have you here. Let me show you around. Takes him to the back of the house. So these guys rolling Cuban cigars. He's like, make sure you get a bunch, take some home, blah, blah, blah. And Chenoweth was like, he, you know, he didn't make the team. He just said, that guy was, the, he's the best teammate who ever lived and just went on nice as humans, you know? Yeah. No, that's, that was awesome to hear. I wanted to ask you about two, two random guys. So, you know, the, uh, the Lakers signed Dennis Rodman for a little while. Yeah. And then they also had J.R. Ryder for a little while. So I wanted to ask you between those two, <laughs> what was it like with those two guys trying to get information about, about them for the book? Uh, I mean, it was really fun when I, I mean, those guys are marquee. For me, those are marquee guys to write about. Like, I love, I, I need guys like that in my life. And um, yeah. <laughs> my thing about Robin that I love is so Robin would shower before games. Like, that's amazing. Robin and, would shower and before. And not games. after? Yeah. No, not after. You shower before <laughs> the games. And J.R. Ryder was only there for a year. And I mean, you probably saw this in a book. I, I, I only had an address for him, I didn't have a phone number. So I drove out to J.R. Ryder's house in Arizona. That's right. And uh, knock on the door. I'm armed with one of my books. And a uh, little kid answers. I'm like, hey, is J.R. here? And uh, a woman comes to the door. I'm like, hey, is J.R. here? Finally, J.R. Ryder comes to the door. And he's like, uh, who are you? Hey, my name is Jeff Ferrellman. I'm a writer. I'm doing a book about the Lakers, blah, blah, blah. Nah, bro. No. Nah. Bro. Nope. No, 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 bro. No fucking way. No, you fucking, <laughs> fucking kidding me. You just show up at my house. You fucking kidding me. And he opens the door. Bro, that's not cool. Bro, bro, it's fucking not right, man. You fucking don't. You fucking, what's that book you got? I'm like, oh, it's a book I wrote about the USFL. 
Is that the Trump League? I'm like, yeah. So, so what's the book you're working on? I'm like, it's about the Lakers. Yeah, was, was, those are some good years, man. All right, I'll talk to you. <laughs> two hours. He was great. So damn, what? That's so random. That's you never random. know. I'm yeah. a, uh, I'm a believer in knocking on doors. It's ter- It is terrifying. It's always yes. terrifying. Yes. But it's kind of like, would you not fly somewhere because you know there's going to be turbulence? No, it's right. Too, right. Right. I wanted to ask you before we get to Kobe. I wanted to ask you about Phil Jackson. So just on basically on you know what you got from him, and you had to go up to Montana to go interview him. So what was that like? I know you had to go through Genie Bus to get the interview and all that stuff. So what was the whole experience with Phil like for you? So to be clear, I freaking love Jeannie Bus. Um, she's one of the best people in sports. Can't say enough nice things about her. Um, and she, I emailed her once. You know, she used to date Phil, and obviously worked for her too. And right. I was like. Uh, I emailed her and I was like, do you have any advice how to get Phil? She's like, well, let me email him for you. So she emailed him and he wrote me back and he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, I'll talk to you. And I was like, is there any way I can come out? He's like, I guess so. So I fly out to Montana and I meet him at a coffee shop. I see him walking down the street and we sit down and I'm like, first, I just want you to know, I really appreciate you doing this. And he goes, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for Jeannie. Oh God. And I'm like, oh fuck. So I figure I'll get an hour. Right. We're talking. He's like, I figure I'll drive you around Flathead Lake. You want to take a, round, a drive around the lake? It's like a three-hour drive. I'm like, yeah. We're driving around the lake. We stop for lunch. He's like, you want to come back to my house? We could sit on the porch. We go back to his house. We sit on the porch. He's like, I'm going to take a nap. I was like, all right. Well, it's good. He's like, you want to get dinner later? Okay. <laughs> I basically spent eight hours with him in Montana. He was really nice, really charming, really interesting, like a decent guy. Um, yeah, I got nothing. I, I cannot tell you a bad thing about Phil Jackson as far as he was great. He could have been greater. He was superb. That's awesome. Yeah. As far as, I mean, could you, like, what was it like talking to him about basketball? I know he talked a lot to you about life and whatnot, and maybe not as much basketball, but what was, like, talking to, like, does he live up to the hype as, like, his basketball mind? So, I'm sure he does, right? Yeah. But it's not really, like, I wouldn't say, like, him – I don't think he lived for talking to me about basketball. I see. Like, I think he liked the idea of driving this guy around and showing him Montana and showing him this place he loves and stopping for lunch and just having a casual day with someone. Like, it sounds weird. It wasn't like we were like, all right, here's the keys to the triangle. And he, right, right. He's not really that guy, actually. So I enjoyed him more as a human than I did as a, as a, just a basketball source, you know? Oh, okay. No, that's cool. It's good to get that side of people, too. That's yeah. – these books to me are um, – like the least interesting part for me personally are the games. Right. And the most interesting thing are the people. So I'd rather have eight hours of Phil Jackson talking about his childhood than eight hours of Phil Jackson talking about the triangle. Right. Right. But what I'm yeah. looking for. Yeah. No, for sure. All right. So I got to get to Kobe about stuff. So this is for, you know, those of us that are, that are, you know, my age group, like we grew up idolizing a lot of us that are Kobe fans. We grew up idolizing him. He could do no wrong. Like he was a star. And then, you know, he, after Shaq left, he, he, it was his team after that. But this book really focuses on the first half of his career. And to be honest, there was a, a lot of, like I was telling you earlier, kind of like a villain. There's a lot of negative stories there. And the whole the rape case was detailed really well in this book and it's hard to to root for him as a person after that and as in our mutual person uh i guess your buddy and my, my radio guy jim rome says we don't know these guys personally right they're just athletes we don't know them what are your thoughts on kobe as a whole and how he treated people and what was it like for you to write this book about all the stuff about him i mean so he wouldn't talk like he made it clear early on he would not he was still alive when I was working doing the book. And that wasn't, that's not unusual. I mean, you write biographies and I, I always say like Shaq talked, Phil talked, Kobe didn't talk. Um, you certainly didn't owe it to me to talk. You're not making money off the book. You don't get editorial say over the book. I, I, I never regret someone for not talking, but he didn't talk. So, you know, he's, he's obviously one of the three big figures and maybe the biggest figure. And it's not like I grew up people, you know, overall the books have been received very well. The people who are like, uh, blah, blah, blah. They're like, well, you came in with an angle or you came in with a so-and-so or a bias. And I'm like, I'm telling you, I had no real thoughts on Kobe Bryant before this book, except he's a really good player. He shot a lot. 
that's it. You know, it wasn't like I came into this thinking, ah, oh, I, I can't wait to stomp all over Kobe or I can't wait to praise Kobe. Like, I, I, it's not how I work anyway. Like, it's not, it's not my goal. Thing is, you start interviewing people and interviewing people and interviewing people. And you do get this picture. Like, we're just being honest. Like, you get this picture. He was a pain in the ass. He was difficult. Um, he was a problem for a lot of these guys for a long yeah. time. That doesn't mean, I always say this, that does not mean when he died at age 41, 41? Yeah. That he was a bad person. I'm not saying that at all. Um, he just was immature from this, in this time period, and he could yeah. be really difficult. He had great moments. Of, I mean, look, you grew up in Southern California. Yeah. Maybe you disagree with what I'm about to say, but this is my take, okay? Sure. You tell me if I'm wrong, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I feel like... I think I learned this being out here. I don't think I would have known this if I were living in New York right now. I feel like the legacy of Kobe Bryant, the number one legacy of Kobe Bryant for people your age and younger and whatever is it's not the five championships. It's not, Oh, he's a great Laker. It's like doggedness, the work ethic. I would do anything to beat you. The idea that you can set a goal as a young person and actually accomplish it. Um, that you can fight and bust your ass. And I don't think anyone with maybe the exception of Michael Jordan has symbolized that. And in fact, I would say Kobe more than Jordan came to symbolize more than anything, more than winning, more than blah, 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 is just doggedness, a pure doggedness. Um, and I think that throughout this book, you can say, oh, the book, it's really, it's hard to read this about Kobe. It's hard to read about Kobe. I never suggest a guy was not a dogged, dogged, dogged worker and a perfectionist and wanted this really badly. Just in pursuing it, he could be a pain in the ass. For sure. No, I totally agree with you. And I'm not saying you did. You had an angle. Well, I'm not you offended know. either way. I, right, also, right. Also, like, if you felt that way, I never get mad at people who say, oh, you're too hard. Like, I get it. You love this guy. He's a freaking beloved player. Right. I, there are probably people who might be better served not reading this book if you're a diehard Laker fan, but you just want to think of Kobe there's nothing wrong with that. It's just entertainment. Right. Yes, entertainment at the end of the day. And you know what, though? I'm okay with it because I want to be objective. I don't want to just hide all the bad stuff about him. Like, I want to know the full story on him. And, you know, it just, he just did, it seemed like he just didn't treat people very well. You know, that's just the bottom line. Like, he just, especially the rookies that came in and Shaq was kind of like, hey, don't worry about him. Like, I'll, I'll, I got you guys, which kind of, it does make Shaq look more of like the more lovable, you know, person in this relationship <laughs> i do um i do think it's funny the one there was one where uh he was ordering i think it was was jenna with or peter cornell he's ordering one of them to fetch him gatorades yeah and he was like your rook get me a gatorade first of all guy wasn't even a rookie he was just like a, yeah he wasn't was, a rookie no your rook get me a gatorade so the guy shuffles off to get him a gatorade he comes back and he's like yo rook don't you know i need the 24 ounce not the 12 ounce <laughs> shuffles off Yo, Rook, don't, anyone who knows me knows I want red. And uh, Kobe, uh, Shaq, sitting behind him, finally just goes, yo, Kobe, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, uh, it was, the book was awesome. Very entertaining. If you're a Laker fan, this is, this is it, man. It's called Three Ring, or Three Ring Circus, the Kobe, Sha or Kobe, Shaq, Phil, and the Crazy Dynasty. It was really awesome. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you're, you kind of uh, alluded to it earlier, but you're working on a Bo Jackson book. I was going to ask you what you're working on. I am. Let me wait. How old are you? 33. Do you feel like most of your, are oh, you play baseball? Do you feel like yeah. most of your peers, if we took a hundred, hundred guys you played minor league baseball with, how many would know who Bo Jackson is? All of them probably. Oh. He's like a myth, right? And I've seen documentaries on him. He is like just, you've everyone's seen the highlight of him running up the wall in, in the in center yeah. field or hitting just monstrous homers and just the athleticism and the like, to be able to be, he was Deion Sanders before Deion Sanders, like, but even more powerful, you know what I mean? Like, wait, the guy ran, I'm not kidding. Yeah. The guy was 230 pounds and he won a, ran a 4-1-7-40. It's, Freak. Yeah. it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous how gifted he was. And, and it's, uh, it's funny because you said, you know, it's like mythology. It's almost what makes it a book is the short span of it all. Like if he had gone on, to have like a, whatever, an Albert Bell baseball career, yeah. an Eric Dickerson football career, it's not nearly as interesting. It's the mythology of it all. And just this guy who was here and he was amazing and he did these crazy things. And you could go on YouTube and see a hundred of them. And then just one day it's like, poof. Yeah. 
But it's, it's not like he was – and he was an all-star. He made the all-star team for, in, for baseball. And the, Pro Bowl in the NFL. And the Pro Bowl. Like, that is he won the Heisman serious – and the Heisman. He's serious talent. All right. Here's what I'll tell you about Bo Jackson. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah let's hear it. Bo Jackson, McAdory High School in Bessemer, Alabama. He, uh, <laughs> he won the state decathlon. And the next day as a senior, he won the state decathlon without having to run the mile because he was so far ahead. The mile's the last event. He didn't even have to run the mile. The next day, he pitched his only game of the year. He hated pitching, but his coach needed him. In a state playoff game, struck out 15, won the game. He attempted – he stole 80 of 81 bases in high school. His senior year, he hit 20 home runs, which was the national record. I mean, it's just like a joke. It's like a joke how ridiculously good of an athlete he was. I, you say Deion Sanders. To me, Deion was small and fast, so there's something at least human about him. Bo, 230 pounds. Yeah. It's, it's insane. The first time I really – because they did a thir- – I think they did 30 for 30 on him, the Bo knows. And that's when I really saw some of those highlights. But, I mean, I've seen him over the years, like just all the crazy stuff that he used to do and just run people over in football. Like, did you – did someone pitch you that idea or did you want to write that book? No, I want to do it. I, I, yeah. I'm 48, so when I was growing up, I, I mean, there's just something mythical about him. And I remember, yeah. like, 1989 All-Star game. He's uh, – I mean, he, he basically – he struck out almost 200 times every year. He was a – he had no plate discipline whatsoever. But for the All-Star game, Tony La Russa decided to have him lead off. It's his first All-Star game. San Francisco's Rick Russell is pitching. In the booth, calling the game. Vince Scully and Ronald Reagan, recently done as president. Bo Jackson, leading off the game, hits a home run. This is in Anaheim. Yeah. It's a home run that just goes into the black. And it's, it's just ridiculous. And here's the crazy thing. The whole Bo Nose commercial was launching after that half inning. So just by timing and weirdness, he hits his home run. All the Nike guys are watching him hit this home run, going crazy wherever they are. Like, holy shit. Because now the inning ends and you're seeing these new Bo No ads for the first to buy Bo No's ads. He just was a freaking myth. He really was. That is wild. Wow. That's cool that you get to – how long does it take you to write a book? Just curious. Like, two, you know, years. two years. Wow. Two years. Wow. I'm deep into it. Okay. So when it, do you know when it's about when it's going to drop? Well, it's due about a year from now. So it'll probably come out seven months after that. These things take forever. Oh, right. Okay. You know, but it's fun. Yeah. It's a fun one. Yeah. Is baseball your favorite sport, even though you were a writer for, about baseball for a while? Um, I would say nowadays I'm more NBA. Okay. But um, growing up, baseball was my sport, and I, I was, I was mainly my sport. I, I like the pace of baseball. I yeah. love um, – I have a son who's 14, and I love – like, I miss this season. Like, I love – Angel Stadium is a joke. It's so bad. The food is bad. Everything's uh, bad. The team's uniform suck. Everything about it sucks. Yeah. But the tickets are so cheap. And – we just go, we buy our $4 tickets, we sit in the stands, just talking, drinking sodas. It's just... It's good for it. kids to go there, right? And I actually grew up a Dodger fan, so my dad grew up a Dodger fan. So even though I live in Orange County, I didn't grow up an Angel fan. It's just, the, the, it's just a different feeling when you walk into Dodger Stadium, in my opinion. Oh, you know, like by just, far. Yeah. And my, um, my one friend, my, my, I mentioned Sal Fasano. The only friends I have from baseball, I have three guys I covered. One was Sal Fasano. One was a former catcher named Brian Johnson. And the other is uh, Sean Green, who's oh, uh, yeah. an Orange County guy also. Yeah. And um, there's something, when I was covering baseball, and I'd be writing about like Sheffield or Sean Green, and you'd walk into Dodger Stadium. First you drive up, Chavez. I mean, Dodger Stadium to Angel Stadium is like yeah. Mike Trout to me, you know, as far as <laughs> baseball. It's not even the same ballpark. Yeah. yeah. No, that's great. All right, I've taken enough of your time. We can, hey, who's we your can... favorite Dodger? Oh, see, kidding. okay, all right. Right now or? No, when you were, uh, when you were growing up. Uh, Mike Piazza was pretty cool when I was a kid. I, I liked him. But honestly, like, I, I did like the Dodgers. And they had a bunch of good rookies back then. You know, they had, Mo- they had Mondesi. They had Hideo Nomo. They had all these dudes. Channel Park. And those random guys. Um, if someone put a gun to your head right now, okay, <laughs> and said, Mike Piazza, clean or not clean? Uh, I don't know. Some argue he's the, the, one of the best hitting catchers of all time. I, uh, Let me just tell you something. I don't know. I was covering baseball. Yeah. Okay? 
was covering. I covered a lot of. Mets. Oh yeah, you would know more than me. I'm just saying, I covered a lot of Mets during the Piazza era. Okay. First of all, the guy was like, a, I forgot what round he was picked, but it was a favor for Tony for Tommy Larusa. Right, like the for, uh, 60th Tommy round or 50 something round. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He, I had never seen an adult human with more acne on his back than Mike Mike Piazza, and I'm. I know that's not the be all end all. I'm not saying it is. It's definitely possible. It's, you know. It was that era. He was a very likable guy. He was, yeah. I'll tell you a real funny story real quick. So yeah, I, when ahead. I was at Sports Illustrated, my claim to infamy back then was I did the story about a baseball player named John Rocker. Yeah. He was a racist relief pitcher. Right. <laughs> and I wrote the story and it came out. And a lot of ball, a lot of, I'd show up at stadiums and a lot of the players were not very happy to see me. They felt like I had done wrong one of their own, you know, like. Sure. You're going after him. Which is ridiculous. I mean, he literally called a black teammate a fat monkey. You tell me what I'm supposed to do with these things, right? So <laughs> I'm in the Mets clubhouse. And the, I didn't know Piazza, though. I, 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 didn't, I, I never dealt with him. I'm in the Mets clubhouse one day. And the clubhouse guy, he's like, hey, Mike wants to talk to you. And I'm like, he doesn't want to talk to me. He comes back up. He's like, yeah, Piazza wants to talk to you. You're Jeff Perlman, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Piazza wants to talk to you. I'm like, fuck, this guy's going to chew me out about John Rocker, really. So. I walk up to Piazza's locker and he's like, are you Jeff Perlman? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you wrote that Sports Illustrated story about Rocker? I was like, yeah. He goes, what was he thinking? Jesus, <laughs> what an idiot, blah, 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 blah. I was like, ah, oh, okay. I don't care if you uh, use the answer. I'm okay now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, was gonna, I, hey, I was only going to cut this off because, you know, I thought maybe you wanted to go. I don't know. But uh, do you have any other cool stories from your, your covering – career that you're willing to, to talk about i mean uh shoot i had a law i had a i mean i i covered baseball at si for a pretty good amount of time yeah and um i mean i'll tell you the funny thing was when i did that so all right i wrote the john rocker story the john rocker story when you were probably negative two years old yeah. it was like a huge it was like a big deal. It blew yeah, up. yeah, for sure. Right. And it, it, it kind of put me on a map, you know, like, okay. as a thing. and there was a time when I'd be, again, like I'd be in clubhouses after that and people wouldn't want to talk to me. People wouldn't want to talk to me. And SI assigned me to do a story on Gary Sheffield when he was with the Dodgers. And I had known him a little bit and always liked Gary Sheffield. So I called the Dodgers up and I talked to the PR guy. The PR guy goes, uh, yeah, chef doesn't want to talk to you, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's, he doesn't want to do it. And I remember thinking like this, that's weird. Like he's, I don't know. He's maybe this is too simple, but like he's an African-American guy who's mad about me, about a racist really. That doesn't make any sense. Right. And chef, it wasn't really like that. So I show up at the Dodgers game and, uh, I just went and I'm like, uh, I'm like, Hey, I don't know if you want to talk to me, but he goes, I'll talk to you. What, what are you even talking about? The PR guy for the Dodgers like lied to me about Gary Sheffield because he had a problem with me writing the rocker story. Oh, wow. I just, you know, like, you know, you know, people, I mean, people are assholes and uh, I love Sheffield. I actually love Sheffield and Jim Edmonds after I wrote that John rocker story um, could have been better to me. He was like, what was that guy thinking? You know, like there were guys out there who were very good about it. Then there are other guys who were just assholes about it. So was that your, that was your first big, like, polarizing story i don't have that many polar you know it's not like i'm like i really had i'll tell you so i really had two like i um i probably had two two major stories that were considered uh stories at si the one was john rocker and then in 2000 they wanted me to do a story about david wells remember david wells yeah the pitcher he was a he was a notorious pain in the ass okay and he was with the blue jays and they signed me a story on him, and he wouldn't talk to Sports Illustrated. He wasn't a jerk to me. He was like, look, I, I'm mad at SI. I'm not going to talk to him, but you can, if you want to be there when I talk to the media, I'm not going to be a jerk, blah, blah, blah. So I wrote this story about David Wells, and my whole idea was David Wells was an obese pitcher. He, like, he was factually overweight. Yes. And he was still great. He was having this brilliant year with Toronto. Yeah. Like, so I wrote this whole lead to the story about how David Wells is fat. My lead was <laughs> David Wells is fat. Oh, God. Blah, 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 blah. He's... He has three chins and blah, 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 blah. Oh. And the reason I wrote it in my head, it was like this ode to David Wells. Like he's this overweight guy, but he's still amazing. So I'm sitting in the press box. The story comes out. 
And I'm sitting in a press box in, I think, Seattle watching a game. And I see a story cr- come across the wire. And the headline was like, rocker rider in, wa- in, in hot water again. And as David Wells bashing me to a reporter saying, like, he did it to rocker. And now he did it to me. And I was Dang. like, what are you talking about? You know, like, <laughs> but then my wife, she's like, you know, that lead, that wasn't very good. And she was probably right. Anyway, it's, <laughs> I've had a very, I've had a very fortunate, like a very, it's the best job you could possibly have. It's pretty freaking awesome. And writing books is great. And all these stories. My, when I was at SI, there was another writer named Jack McCallum. Oh yeah. The great writer. And he said, um, you're not going to be the richest, but you're going to have the best stories every day at every high school reunion. And uh, that is definitely shown to be true. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Where can we uh, follow you or on social media or follow your stuff? I know you have a website, jeffperlman.com. But, yeah, uh, at Jeff Perlman on Twitter. Okay. But I'm, I'm annoying. It's not Are always good. Uh, oh, okay. I'm very political. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All but, right. Uh, I'm trying to be better about that. My okay. wife's like, you have to. Now that he lost, can you just be normal? I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got you. Well, hey, I really appreciate your time. It was awesome, man. Thank you for the stories. I really enjoyed your book, Three Ring Circus. Everybody can go check it out, and I'll post the links at when the episode drops soon. But uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a pleasure to meet you, so thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Man, if you guys didn't enjoy those stories, that's some inside information right there. That's some great uh, reporting and writing by Jeff. Uh, once again, Jeff Perlman. Big thanks to him, jeffperlman.com. You can find all of his books there, including the most recent one called Three Ring Circus, talking about the Kobe Shack and Phil uh, crazy Lakers dynasty back in the 90s and 2000s. That was awesome. And all the other stories we got out of them too. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, great to catch up with Jeff. My thanks to him. Had a great time on that interview. As always, you can find me at Two Tall Sports Podcast on Instagram. On Twitter, it's going to be at Two Tall Sports. If you'd like to email the show, please do so, Two Tall Sports Podcast at gmail.com. I'm on YouTube. Please just type it in, find me, subscribe. You can watch the interviews there and see all of the, all the previous episodes as well. Uh, Spotify, please follow there. And of course, Apple Podcasts, if you could subscribe, rate, and review, that'd be a really big help. Try to push the show along and uh, get some more exposure for us. So we really appreciate you listening as always. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And let's get ready for season two. It's, uh, it's, it's here, so we're going to be bigger and better this year. And, and we need all the uh, listener support we can get. So thank you very much and uh, happy 2021. <laughs>